Right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to everyone joining us today for the BSP UP Professorial Chair Lectures. My name is Jed Soto Domingo from the BSP Research Academy. I will be your moderator for today's event. A link to the program will be shared in the chat box for everyone's reference. Also, to ensure that today's event will be an enriching one for all involved, we direct the attention of our participants to a few reminders which will be shown on screen. Some reminders, the audience are requested to reserve their questions for the Q&A forum at the end of each presentation. The audience are enjoined to use the race hack feature of the Zoom uh, software to facilitate the Q&A forum in an orderly manner. The audience may also use the chat feature of Zoom to relay their questions. The audience may send their questions to everyone or privately to the moderator. And also, when, whether asking the question live or relaying it via the chat box, the audience are requested to use the following format when asking questions. First, your name, your university, institution, or agency, and finally, the question. All right, well, uh, with that, it is my honor to introduce Deputy Governor Sid Amador. Dr. Maria Almasara Sid Antoine Amador is Deputy Governor of the Corporate Services Sector of BSP and Head of the BSP Research Academy with a PhD from the Australian National University and is a maroon-blooded UP student. To kick off the day's event, we will now listen to the welcome remarks of Deputy Governor Sid. A very good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the Professorial Chair Lecture Series, which is organized by the BSP Research Academy, or as we fondly call it, the BRAC. Uh, these trying times remind us that solid, credible, and independent research is an endeavor that needs to be front and center in the strategic priorities of any institution that seeks to be a thought leader in its chosen mandate. Sound research fertilizes the ground for well-informed policies as well as a strong and resilient structural reform agenda. This is the second day of the BSP UP Professorial Chair Lecture Series for 2021. The Professorial Chair Lecture Series is a celebration of research and creative activity. The lectures provide us with an avenue to showcase the shareholders' intellectual abilities and curiosity as evident in their discussion of the theoretical and empirical underpinnings of their research, especially as this apply to the current operating landscape marked by what some has called radical uncertainty. But equally important, we hope to stimulate interest among the members of the uh, of the research community within the BSP as well as with its research partners so that we can discuss candidly and freely issues that affect our lives and our economy with a view to delivering a better quality of life for all Filipinos as is in the BSP mandate. Allow me to go into a bit of history on the BSP UP professorial chairs at the School of Statistics. The endorsement started in 2010 with two chairs, the Centennial Professor in Statistics and the Sterling Professor in Government and Official Statistics. Since then, seven shareholders have occupied the position. Today, the first national statistician of the Philippines, Dr. Lisa Grace Barsales, will be presenting her paper on revisiting the leading indicators of the Philippines' leading economic indicator system. On a personal note, I'm very glad to hear and see Lisa once again, as we have worked together on some projects when she was with the PSA some years back. Her presentation will be followed by the lecture on a hybrid time series ensemble, deep learning forecasting approach with applications to economic variables by Dr. Peter uh, Julian Kaiton. From my parochial perspective as a central banker, Collaboration in diverse multidisciplinary issues supports better understanding of the issues and deeper appreciation of policy outcomes compared to what can be had if these issues are seen only through the lens of central bankers. By working collectively with other knowledge-based centers, we can leverage on the shareholders' expertise, skill sets, policy tools, and resources to obtain new insights 
distill lessons and craft sensible policies. By promoting cross-engagements cross in policy and applied research, the BSP and the UP College of Statistics could continue to remain relevant as thought leaders, as institutions that are trusted, reliable, influential, and authoritative in their commitments to the public. We hope that the two thought-provoking lectures will spark interest among our researchers and observers of the Philippine economy to examine relevant and critical issues with a view to crafting responsible and responsive, sensible and coherent policies. Thank you and a very good afternoon to everyone. Right, uh, we send our thanks to uh, DG Sid Amador for her welcome remarks. And now without further ado, our first lecturer is Dr. Lisa Grace S. Persales, the BSP Sterling Professorial Chair in Government and Official Statistics. She will present the study entitled, Revisiting the Leading Indicators of the Philippines Leading Economic Indicator System. Thereafter, our discussant is none other than Dr. Claire Dennis S. Mapa. Dr. Lisa Grace S. Bersales is Professor of Statistics at the University of the Philippines School of Statistics and currently Vice President for Planning and Finance of the UP system. She's the first national statistician of the Philippines and served in, a, in this capacity from April 2014 to April 2019, heading the Philippine Statistics Authority. During this period, she was also the Philippines Civil Registrar General and started the implementation of the Philippines National Identification System. She implemented the Philippine Statistical Act of 2013 in the creation of the Philippine Statistics Authority. She served as co-chair of the UN Statistical Commission's Interagency Expert Group for Sustainable Goals Indicators in 2014 to 2015, vice chair of the Regional Steering Group for Civil Registration and Vital Statistics Decade for Asia and the Pacific in 2014 to 2016 chair of the advisory council to the UN Statistical Institute for Asia and the Pacific in 2018, chair of the executive committee of the Part Partnership in Statistics for Development in the 21st Century or Paris 21 in 2016 to 2018, and president of the Philippine Statistical Association, Inc. in 2018 to 2019. She is currently a board member of the Open Day Watch, a member of the Thematic Research Network for Data and Statistics, or TRENDS, of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and in the editorial team of the Statistical Journal of the International Association of Official Statistics. Dr. Claire Dennis Mapa is currently the National Statistician and Civil Registrar, of, Civil Registrar General of the Philippine Statistics Authority, or PSA. Prior to his appointment, he served as Dean and Professor in Statistics, School of Statistics, University of the Philippines, Diliman. He is also the current president of the Philippine Statistical Association, Inc., PSAI, the professional organization of statisticians in the Philippines. A multi-awarded researcher, Dr. Mapa is awarded the UP Scientist in 2012 to 2014 and 2018 to 2020, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas Sterling Professor in Government and Official Statistics in 2014, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019. The SEARCA Regional Professorial Chair for Poverty Research in 2015 and the 2008 National Academy of Science and Technology or NAST, Outstanding Young Scientist in the Field of Economics. His research interests are in the areas of econometric and financial time series analysis, empirical economic growth, poverty analysis, and impact evaluation. And with that, Dr. Bersales, a very good afternoon, Paul. We turn the floor very excitedly to you. Maraming salamat, Paul. Maraming salamat, Jed. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to first thank the Banco Central ng Pilipinas for continuing to support the University of the Philippines, um, and specifically the UP School of Statistics. It's really our honor to have this professorial chairs awarded to faculty of the school. And I would like to thank, of course, um, uh, my current dean, uh, Dr. Joseph Ryan Alsangan, for the support to the faculty in the research that we do. And special thanks to Yusek Dennis, who I personally requested to be my discussant <laughs> uh, and uh, for saying yes, given his really uh, busy schedule, I feel that he will be the best discussant given 
that he is now the national statistician and is looking into uh, many official statistics and among them I believe will be the leading economic indicator for the Philippines. So may I now uh, make my presentation. This particular uh, topic is of interest to me because I actually was part of the National Statistical Coordination Board team before that looked into the leading economic indicator system of the Philippines uh, during certain years. So I was not really part of the work in, uh, in all the years that this was done, but uh, in certain years, I was actually looking with them at the leading economic indicator system of the Philippines. Uh, and I felt that uh, it is good to revisit the leading, the LEIS, uh, uh, given that we are now in the age of digitization and we also have of the pandemic. So I was thinking, how are the indicators that could uh, provide some early warning to the economy? Uh, are, still they, are they still the same? Are there something new? And, and so uh, the Philippines has actually been studying leading economic indicators, even in the early 1990s. And uh, they started in 1993 and 1996 as projects. And uh, I remember that the project proponents then were uh, Terry DeVeza, <laughs> uh, uh, BSP's, BSP's own, uh, Dr. Romulo Virola of the NSCB, and uh, Randy Polistico, who is uh, currently also with the PSA. And uh, I believe that the results were very promising. The results were very promising. And thus, uh, the NSCB board uh, approved the release of the leading economic indicator system starting 1997. And it continued uh, to be compiled and published um, until 2014 when uh, the Philippine Statistics Authority was formally created, uh, but it ended there. And I was the head of the PSA then, and uh, it was actually my decision not to uh, continue the release until we review the leading indicator system. And uh, it, it didn't happen. And uh, that's really something that I was always thinking about. And thus, when I was awarded the professorial chair, BSP professorial chair, uh, I, I decided to go into looking at this again. And I also would like to thank uh, USEC Dennis for saying yes, because before I started this study, I asked permission of, of, from him if I can continue the work, the study. So uh, the leading economic indicator system is quarterly. Its reference series is the non-agriculture gross value added. So these are uh, the uh, industry and services sector of the economy. Uh, and and uh, the indicator series, for its last release in 2014, there were 11 of them. Uh, there, there are 11 of the many series that were considered and they were the ones that indicated correlation with the non-agriculture gross value added. So CPI, electric energy consumption, exchange, uh, peso, dollar, peso US dollar exchange rate, hotel occupancy rate, money supply, M2 specifically, number of new business incorporations as registered in the SEC, 
the stock price index, terms of trade index, total merchandise imports, visitor arrivals, and the wholesale price index. Uh, the methodology of the leading economic indicator system actually follows the usual methodology, which is used uh, officially by other countries. So uh, Japan, Korea, the OECD countries uh, as a whole, uh, they, they actually follow the usual uh, methodology, which was also developed by the, uh, uh, the US, the NBER uh, specifically. And so uh, the, 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 the process is to get a number of possible uh, component indicator series, individual series that could uh, provide uh, information on uh, the economy. And the usual criteria are that they should represent and actually accurately measure important economic processes or variables. They should provide adequate coverage of the major sectors of the economy. They should be promptly available and not subject to large revisions and should be consistently leading or conforming to the business cycle movements of what is called the reference series. And uh, of course, these particular criteria with them are some statistical uh, criteria as well, uh, especially about uh, data being available and not subject to large revisions and that they conform to the business cycle movement. So there are some correlation on studies there. Uh, and thus, uh, uh, along with these four criteria, are usually statistical guidelines as well criteria as well. Uh, aside from the indicator series, the, a reference series should be uh, identified. Uh, there are some indicator systems, however, uh, where there is really no clarity on the reference series. So they just say this, these are the indicators that provide uh, leading information on the economy. Uh, once the indicator uh, series, the various component series for a composite uh, indicator are selected, they undergo a series of uh, preparation, data preparation. So smoothing, seasonal adjustment, detrending, uh, normalization. And so uh, for the leading economic indicator series, the system of the Philippines, seasonal adjustment is done using the X11 ARIMA, the basis of which really is the census X11 of the US. Uh, then after which uh, the trend is removed and uh, for the LAIS, a Hodrick Prescott uh, smoothing process is uh, used. Uh, once the series is smoothened, uh, they trended, seasonally adjusted, uh, correlation of the, what we would have would be the business cycles or the cycles of the component series and the reference series and correlations are done. So in the case of the leading economic indicator system, simple correlations are done uh, of the past values of the component series with the current uh, non aggregate GBA cycle, After, from which it is determined which particular periods the different series lead the non agri And uh, the composite leading economic indicator called the LEI is simply the linear combination of the cycles of the component series weighted by the correlation uh, and in the 
uh, uh, LEIS process, the selection of the lead period is based on the period where the indicator, component indicator has highest correlation with the cycle of the done agri GPA. And um, in the 2014 uh, first quarter release, this was how uh, the LEI versus the reference series moved. As you can see, uh, the, you can really not see very well by just looking at this. So uh, in the releases of the NSCD and of the PSA, uh, they did a lot of uh, some analytic or uh, summary discussions on what these movements mean. Now, in revisiting the LEIS, originally, I wanted to already work with a monthly LEI, monthly LEI, given that uh, PSA already releases uh, or uh, collects uh, labor force statistics on a monthly basis. Uh, however, there is not enough information yet not enough number of data points uh, for the labor force statistics. So I decided to just work with the quarterly. And the period covered is from quarter one, 2011 to quarter three, 2021. Reference series is still non-agriculture gross value added. And uh, 18 indicator series were eventually used and one of the important criterion I used in the selection of the indicator series is that the historical data are readily available through open data from the websites of the various agencies that release them. And I'm really very happy to note that many of our government agencies are releasing or providing open data uh, historical data in the website. So uh, the data that I've used are, uh, a lot of them are from the PSA, from the DSP, and uh, uh, for, for other series from other websites. Uh, the methodology I use to produce uh, the revisited LEI is basically the same steps, except that I used X12 for the seasonal adjustment, and I used uh, in determining the lead period of the component series, I didn't use the uh, period of the highest correlation between the cycle of the component series and the uh, uh, cycle of the non-agri GBA. I used instead the highest, uh, period value of the uh, highest lead uh, and used uh, the correlation coefficient there. So the highest significant, the lead period with the highest significant, I'm sorry, the highest lead period, and I'll show you later. Uh, the 11 series of the last release in 2014 are CP, as I've listed already, are as you see in this table. And I wasn't able to include the hotel occupancy rate uh, since historical data are, are not available in the official website. Uh, I would like to thank BSP for providing me with the uh, updated money supply uh, information, but the information is readily available in the website. Uh, however, uh, the money supply is not significantly correlated with the reference series on the period that I'm studying. A number of new businesses, business incorporations are not historical information. It's not readily, readily available at the website of the SEC. Uh, wholesale price index, I was able to get in the 
historical data, but uh, just like money supply, the correlation is not significant with the reference series. So these are uh, uh, what uh, the, the 11 and what were considered for the study I did. These are the additional indicator series. They are, they are, the data are readily available in websites. Uh, and so we have the business confidence index from DSP, the total approved foreign investments from the uh, BOI, Board of Investments, crude oil petroleum Dubai price from our Department of Energy, employment rate, underemployment rate, unemployment rate from PSA, gross international reserves from BSP, national government revenues I grabbed from PSA, I believe, uh, uh, from the national accounts, uh, uh, open data of PSA, number of building permits also from PSA, universal commercial bank loans outstanding from BSP, volume of pallet production from PSA. Uh, these are the graphs of the different series with the non-agri. Uh, as you can see, uh, you, you immediately see that uh, starting um, end of 2019, the, uh, these are actually the years that you see, 19, 20, 21 means 2019, 2020, 2021. You, you see a disruption in the behavior of the uh, series, the different series. And of course, this is the effect of the uh, pandemic. So this is still the list of series that we have. These are the cross correlations of the, dif the different component series. Uh, and this time, uh, this is already the smooth end. Uh, these are already the cycles of the component series and the cycle of the reference series. And these have undergone normalization. And as you can see, for the uh, business confidence index, the, uh, the, uh, it, uh, the business confidence index leads the reference series. And, uh, and uh, the highest lead period of significance is lag four. So uh, this is the lag that I selected instead of the usual in the past where it's the, 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 the lag is selected at the highest correlation between the uh, component series and the reference series. And so this is on the other hand, the uh, data from BOI. I will not show any more the, all the cross correlations. This is now the, these are the cycles of the different component series with the non-agri. And a, a quick glance, uh, you can see that they actually follow the cycles of the component of the different component series follow the cycle of the non-agri, but at varying uh, volatilities. This is the other list. This is the leading indicate leading economic indicator. Uh, this is the normalized uh, leading indica economic indicator. This is actually the second of five uh, tries that I did. And as you can see here, uh, the LLI uh, is a function of uh, business confidence, leading, leading the uh, non-agri or the reference series by four periods. Uh, the, the BOI data leads by five. CPI leads by eight, crude leads by nine. Uh, electric consumption, uh, this should be minus two. Uh, uh, employ, employment rate by one, leads by one. Uh, peso dollar exchange rate leads by four. Uh, gross international receipts, receipts, reserves lead by eight, et cetera. Uh, apologies, those, all of these should have minus, I believe I just, uh, removed some of them when I was looking at, I was trying to put the, the equation here. This is how the uh, leading indicator, LEI, uh, 
looks like versus the non-agreed. So these are the cycles. And uh, the analysis I did did not follow the analysis of the past release. I focused on turning points instead of using LEI as a forecast tool for GDP. And uh, uh, the, this orange are uh, the local minima, while the yellow are the local maxima. So the first column is the leading in the, the LEI, the, I mean, the second column is the LEI. The third column is the uh, reference series cycle. And if if you look at the earlier years, 2014, uh, you have uh, the LEI leading the corresponding turning points of the non-agri GBA. However, when we reach 2019, that's when we see that actually it's now the, it's like the, it's the reference series that is leading the uh, indicator series. So this is really something that I would like to point out that the effect of the pandemic is that there is a change in this, there seems to be a change in the structure of the, of the series and thus uh, is, a, is something that needs to be looked into. Uh, the OECD actually analyzes their leading economic indicator uh, by looking at the uh, areas below the long-term trend, trend, which is 100 in this case, but in the LEI that I used, the long-term trend is at zero. And so, as you can see, if the, if the areas are below the long-term trend, this means that economic activity during those periods are below uh, the long-term trend. And if we look at the LEI and the uh, non-agri cycles, we can see that uh, for the years 2017 to 2019, we see that the uh, cycles show uh, the economy higher than the long-term trend, moving better than the long-term trend. But in recent years, uh, economy is below the long-term trend, but both LEI and uh, reference series show increase. So this particular part, this picture here from 2020 to 2021 shows that economy is recovering uh, and that is the expectation. So there are a number of limitations actually of what I did, uh, but one is that the data are not that, uh, the data for the different component series are actually not readily available in time to uh, provide the picture for economy. So there is a need to forecast them, but in the study, I didn't do any. And uh, also in, in some of the uh, methodologies used by other countries, they actually adjust uh, the cycles for outliers. And I didn't do that. Uh, in my mind, uh, it's it's good to take a look at what the outliers are because of the pandemic. And at, at first, I thought that the study also will give some idea on how the economy is doing uh, in the during uh, in the fact that we are now into digitization, the fourth industrial revolution. But it's it was difficult for me to take a look at the trends uh, and disaggregate the effect of the pandemic with the fourth industrial revolution. So what I can clearly talk about is that uh, we see clearly from the time series, the effect of the pandemic. 
Uh, moving forward, I, I, I recommend that PSA look at these 18 series for consideration. Uh, if the, uh, and I would uh, recommend for the PSA to study uh, the, their LEI system now and see a possibility of compiling and releasing again. I actually recommend eventually a monthly LEI uh, for, for consideration. Uh, thank you very much. All right, well, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Bersales for sharing your work and your wisdom with us. At this point, we will now listen to a discussion by Dr. Mapa. Dr. Mapa, good afternoon po and welcome again. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lisa, my uh, colleague and friend. Uh, also, thank you, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, uh, UP School of Statistics. It's uh, always nice to uh, read papers again. Um, I have um, uh, just a quick uh, uh, set of comments uh, on, on, the, on the paper presented by Dr. Lisa. Okay, so uh, this is the comment um, set of comments on, on the paper, Visiting the Leading Indicators of the Philippines Leading Economic Indicator System by uh, Dr. Lisa Grace Persales. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I uh, present here the motivation of the paper, uh, the objective and methodology, uh, the contribution of the paper, which is very important. Uh, I also um, discuss uh, some of the possible problems uh, that uh, encountered in the process of uh, extracting the cycle and some suggested improvements, uh, particularly Dr. Lisa mentioned the possible uh, shift or, or restructuring of the contributors to uh, economic growth as I will present some of the data prior to COVID and uh, during COVID. Next slide, please. For uh, motivation paper, of course, um, the, the paper is um, um, well motivated. Uh, the uh, idea is uh, to understand the movement uh, of the country's economic activity. You know, and that is very crucial, very important for uh, policy decision-making process. And uh, what, what uh, Dr. Lisa used is a subcomponent of the GDP uh, published by the PSA, which is the broadest measure of the overall economic activity. Uh, in her paper, uh, she used the uh, uh, non-agri uh, components, which are basically industry and, uh, and services. Uh, these are the major components of our uh, gross domestic product. Next slide. The uh, analysis, uh, uh, all, all countries uh, have, have leading economic indicators, uh, whether it's official or uh, in the hands of researchers. Uh, the analysis of the movement along the business cycle of uh, the economic output, as well as the impact of external and internal shocks you know, are critical for uh, our policymakers, our analysts, our researchers, and uh, other stakeholders. Also, the, the motivation of having a leading economic, uh, economic indicator system is, is very important, primarily because there is uh, some delay in the reporting of the actual GDP. Uh, in the Philippines, the Philippine Statistics Authority would report the GDP uh, for the first, second, and third quarters, 40 days after the reference uh, period and uh, the annual and last quarter 30 days after the reference period. So during the time wherein you're waiting for the official report, policymakers and researchers uh, would be interested in alternative methodologies, as mentioned by Dr. Lisa, some monthly series, in fact, in other uh, researches, weekly, daily series, uh, to provide insights in a way of uh, the real time uh, economic activity. And uh, such a system, uh, can be uh, referred to as the leading economic indicator system. So these are the motivations of, of the paper. For the uh, objective and methodology, uh, of course, as presented, uh, the paper visits the uh, uh, leading economic indicator system developed by the National Statistical Coordination Board, the precursor agency of the Philippine Statistics Authority. First uh, uh, output was uh, released in 1997, and uh, the last output uh, was released sometime in 2014. Uh, as uh, an improvement in terms of the number of variables, the uh, paper utilized 18 economic indicators compared to the 11 economic indicators in the original uh, leading economic indicator system to explain uh, the movement of the cycle. So what is, uh, what is being tracked is the cycle 
of the non-agri component of the GDP. As I mentioned, this would be the industry and the, and the services. Next slide. The uh, methodology uh, in the selection of the uh, variables, the methodology used uh, for inclusion criteria as discussed by Dr. Uh, Lisa Versales. Uh, these are the selection of the 18 economic indicators after which seasonal adjustment uh, was uh, uh, made to take out the seasonality of the series. And then after that, the trend component was uh, also taken out using a Hodrick Prescott filter. I will go back to this uh, in a while because this, I think this is the critical step in the, in the process, uh, extraction of the trend component. So after taking out the seasonality and the trend component, you have the cycle and uh, as mentioned, some of the outliers, if there are any. And uh, what, what uh, the step, uh, the next steps would be to just correlate the cycle components of these 18 uh, economic indicators that were uh, identified with the cycle component of the non-agri uh, GDP to obtain the, the lead uh, periods using uh, uh, cross-correlation. And then uh, once you have that, uh, the leading economic indicator, that single variable is now uh, just a linear combination of the cycles of the 18 economic indicators using correlation coefficients as the uh, weights. So this is your LEI as uh, presented in the paper. Next slide. So uh, I will now, uh, of course, uh, go to the contribution of, of the paper. Uh, the, the paper uh, is contributing uh, to the uh, literature in terms of uh, the leading economic indicator system. Uh, the paper presents an easier way to construct the LEI. And uh, while uh, Dr. Lisa did not use it to provide short-term forecasts, uh, another step is just to, to use it to, to have a short-term forecast of the direction of the country's economic performance. So the, the leading economic indicator uh, as presented uh, in, in uh, the eight, using the 18 variables now and even before the 11 variables is, is uh, one of the simpler models uh, in the construction of the LEI. Other now casting models, so these are the, in the literature, these are the, the more popular models. Now casting, real-time forecasting uh, would, would use mixed frequency model, would combine quarterly data, monthly data, daily data, and weekly data, as utilizing, for example, dynamic factor model and uh, uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. So these are alternative models uh, also to construct a sort of a leading economic indicator, but these are really complex in terms of methodology and usually uh, uses a large set of mixed frequency data. So you combine different uh, 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 frequency data, low frequency data, quarterly, uh, monthly with high frequency data, you have daily or even uh, weekly or daily. So uh, the, the paper, uh, I think uh, one of the uh, uh, strength of the paper is that uh, it's simple to, to extract the LEI uh, from the steps uh, presented by uh, uh, Dr. Lisa. Now, um, I will touch on some of the, some of the possible problems that uh, were encountered by the, by the model. Um, uh, first, uh, the, I think the, the main issue here is the extraction of the trend. So the, the paper uh, utilized the Hodrick Prescott filter, a very popular uh, and uh, in fact, this is uh, uh, an earlier 80, 1980 paper, but uh, was, uh, uh, became very popular in 1990s by Hodrick and Prescott to extract the trend component. So if you have a series, you can easily extract the trend component uh, using the Hodrick Prescott filter. But if you look at, if you look the, the, you know, the methodology behind the Hodrick Prescott filter, uh, the, uh, the, the model or the uh, uh, filtering uh, work well if the data is uh, I2 in trend, no, double stochastic trend. So it, it is working best to extract the trend uh, under, uh, under the uh, premise that the series are, are I2. Uh, in other words, uh, before we use the Hodrick Prescott filter, we have to first test uh, the presence of unit truth because it's possible that you have an I1 model, it's possible that you have an I, I0 uh, trend, which is deterministic trend, uh, or some of these are, are I2, a double stochastic trend. So um, extracting uh, the trend using a Hodrick Prescott filter uh, without first testing uh, the presence of unit truth, it could be stochastic or deterministic, uh, might be problematic. In fact, uh, Hamilton, James Hamilton, uh, a famous uh, time series econometrician in uh, 2017, wrote a paper with the title, Why You Should Never Use the Hodrick Prescott Filter. 
and he presents evidence uh, against the use of HP filter in some of these cases. So the, the idea here is that if, if you are not uh, able to uh, uh, verify that it is an I2, there might be some problem in terms of the extraction of the series. In other words, the cycle that will be left might be a spurious uh, dynamic movement because uh, you are not sure what you are actually extracting. Uh, the Hodrick Prescott filter would say that that is the trend. So um, uh, another one is that while uh, Dr. Bersales uh, uh, is interested more of the movement, um, it would always be better to assess the actual performance of the proposed uh, LEI in forecasting the growth rate of the uh, non-agri component of the GDP quarter on quarter using perhaps a combination of within sample prior to the pandemic and, and out of sample. Uh, so uh, the, the, the test for the performance of, of the uh, uh, model uh, should also be established. Um, uh, my my uh, concern in, in the use of uh, the LEI uh, in, in the context of the uh, OAC and uh, uh, was also uh, discussed by, by Dr. Lisa under slide 27 of the paper, wherein if you if the LEI is above zero, it presents an above uh, above the long term trend. No? So uh, this this may be premature, as I've said, because uh, in the first place we don't know whether the trend is uh, that long term trend is stochastic or deterministic. So we really have to test. So we're not sure even uh, if that uh, if that uh, trend uh, that is above zero uh, is really the long term trend no? without uh, without testing it. So uh, my, my uh, uh, suggested improvements uh, proposal here is, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have to first uh, do the testing if you want to extract using Hodrick Prescott filter. Otherwise, there are other ways of extracting the trend, uh, perhaps uh, you know, just using the first difference or uh, a double differencing if the, if the trend is stochastic or just uh, using a uh, deterministic uh, time trend model if the trend is uh, deterministic. So uh, in, in the process of extracting the trend, uh, that can be done by, by testing it. And uh, my suggestion is really uh, for uh, this model, the proposed LEI uh, to be compared with other uh, alternative models in terms of performance uh, models, such as the dynamic factor models, uh, using within sample and out of sample assessment. Uh, assessing it with, with uh, a uh, uh, relatively uh, comparable models uh, also looking at uh, leading economic indicator type uh, would always be better. Uh, another one is to revisit the model, uh, the indicators uh, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic that affected the structure of the economy, uh, because this will have impact on the choice of the variables. Um, we, we would like to know whether this 11, the original 11 variables are still consistent in terms of explaining the, the non-agree, uh, uh, the movement in the non-agree GBA or the 18 variables are suggested, or there are other variables that uh, need to also be considered. So in the, in the slide, I will just show you uh, some uh, data from the Philippine Statistics Authority. This is just a quick, um, a quick uh, way of uh, computing for the contribution to growth of GDP uh, prior to COVID and uh, during COVID and the first nine months of, uh, of this year. So here, I hope you can see uh, prior to COVID, uh, those that are uh, uh, the, the component that is uh, really contributing to uh, GDP growth is services. So, for example, <clears throat> in the growth of 2018, our GDP is about 6.3. Uh, services uh, contributed four percentage points. So that's about two thirds. In uh, 2019, our GDP growth uh, constant prices grew by uh, uh, 6.1. Our GDP grew by 6.1 year in year. And uh, services contributed about 4.33, so more than two thirds. Uh, of course, there's a big drop in, uh, in uh, 2020 because of the pandemic. Now, uh, we are recovering uh, in uh, the first uh, nine months of 2021. But if you look at uh, the last column for the first uh, uh, nine months of 2021, our uh, uh, GDP is uh, uh, grew by 4.9. However, services is just contributing 2.8 percentage points. The uh, industry uh, is uh, contributing uh, larger than, than before uh, as a percentage of uh, the overall GDP growth. So uh, you can see here that there is a shift in terms of the, the sectors that are contributing to the GDP growth. So if this would, if this would be maintained uh, in, in the coming uh, years, for example, it means that there might be some shift in the structure of the economy. 
the next slide is just uh, uh, providing us with the uh, expenditure side. So before um, the uh, major contributor would be the household final consumption expenditure uh, for 2018, uh, that's 4.2621 percentage points of that 6.3. And for 2019, that's 4.26 percentage point to the 6.1. Uh, however, for 2021, uh, of course, in 2020, that's negative. For 2021, it's it's um, just contributing uh, 2.13 percentage points to the 4.9. So the uh, the other uh, subsectors, like for example, gross capital formation and uh, uh, government final consumption expenditure, or even change in inventory, are also contributing. So. Uh, these are some of the information uh, that may uh, impact uh, the choice of variables that will be included in the uh, leading economic indicators. I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, sir, for your, for your thoughts. Uh, at this juncture, we shall uh, shortly open the open forum. <laughs> um, and before we do that, as our audience members prepare their questions, perhaps uh, Dr. Bersales, uh, you may wish to have a, a quick reply uh, to the discussion that we just heard. Thank you very much, uh, Yusek Dennis. Uh, I failed to include in my discussion in my paper of uh, the uh, conduct of the uh, unit root test. Uh, so I used the uh, Dickey Fuller unit root tests uh, on the seasonally adjusted series. And uh, all of them, except for imports of goods, uh, were significant at uh, order two uh, for presence of trend. So thank you for pointing that out. And yes, I've read, I read the paper of Hamilton. <laughs> And uh, that is indeed something that needs to be looked into more uh, as regards the detrending part of this, of the methodology. Uh, also, uh, uh, I appreciate uh, you, Seth Dennis, pointing out of uh, uh, the movements the, uh, of the various uh, sectors and indicators, uh, which I believe would eventually be crucial in determining the final list of component indicators for LEI. Uh, actually, the 18 indicators are, is really, in my mind, uh, too many. Uh, when I looked at the indicator systems of other countries, they had like about 10 or, yeah, not, not, not 18, not that many. So uh, uh, thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bersala. So again, a, a reminder to our audience members, you can either uh, raise your hand virtually through the reactions button in Zoom or chat your questions via the box, either privately to me or uh, for everyone to see. Those of you who are watching us from our live stream, uh, there's a comments uh, box underneath the uh, live stream box. So please feel free to chat there as well. We have staff who will field your questions on our way. So uh, just to warm up the... Um, uh, the question asked, uh, uh, may we uh, go back to some of the points raised uh, by you, Sec, uh, Dennis Map? Uh, sir, you mentioned of some now casting being done uh, uh, by different organizations. What are the forms of uh, data, the, the novel data sets that you are seeing? And how far along are we in explaining what, what uh, you know, how the, what, what's the context, for example, for satellite data? What does satellite data actually explain? Now, there are some studies that use night lights to uh, correlate GDP, for example. Uh, your thoughts, sir, on, on those uh, new forms of data? Yes, um, the use of now casting uh, real-time data, um, as I've mentioned, these are high-frequency data. Uh, I, I know uh, some, some countries are using actually uh, nighttime data. Uh, in, in the Philippines, uh, well, the PSA uh, is using nighttime data, not, not to measure GDP, but to measure poverty. Uh, we, we use it um, in one region. No? So these are really uh, um, alternative methodologies. In, in now casting, uh, the idea there is you have uh, usually a high frequency data. So it could be weekly, it could be monthly, in some cases daily, but for GDP, to use daily may not be uh, practical because um, you you will be have you will have to forecast GDP on a daily basis. 
uh, the, the, the more uh, uh, practical uh, set of measure would be either a weekly or a monthly data. Um, it, it was mentioned by uh, Dr. Lisa uh, in, in, as part of the references uh, in 2014, we, we wrote a paper on uh, um, utilizing dynamic factor models. So these are high frequency data uh, to, uh, um, to now cast uh, GDP, not on a quarterly basis, but on a monthly basis so that you have uh, you have sort of uh, uh, information on the on the direction of the gdp uh, real time so uh, let's say if it is the first month of the quarter you have already an idea what is the gdp during that month after another month you have an idea what would be the gdp on the first two months and and the last month you have the whole quarter gdp so there, there is a, a a vast literature uh, in terms of uh, the use of now casting thank you Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bersales. Would you, have, would you have any additional thoughts on that same line of thinking? I'd be interested to hear uh, your point of view on that area. Actually, uh, in my paper, I cited the paper of Dr. Mapa and Dr. and uh, Professor Aldis, uh, their use of now casting. In my mind, it's high time really to come up with a monthly uh, uh, LEI. Uh, uh, because I believe that, that the monthly LEI will really give uh, uh, policymakers more lead time uh, to know what's going on, uh, where the economy is headed. Uh, as regards the use of nightlights, uh, yes, I echo what uh, Yusek Dennis said. In, in, in some of the uh, uh, research that, that, that I did with the UP statistical research, uh, 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 I'm sorry, of, uh, of the Philippine Statistical, statistical Research and Training Institute, uh, the use of night lights were used more uh, for poverty uh, uh, estimation. But of course, uh, they, are, they could be indicators of economic activity as well. Uh, but, but here in the Philippines, we need to look more closely at how big data, satellite data specifically can be used for uh, leading economic indicators. Uh, so I, I, uh, that is something that needs more, more research uh, in my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bersales. All right, uh, so- If I may please, add, please, Jen. Please, of course, of course. If I may add, uh, uh, there, this is something that needs more discussion, but I don't know if this is really part of my study. Uh, I, I didn't mention it actually, but one issue then about the release of the, the leading economic indicator system by uh, PSA was PSA is going to do estimation of GDP and it's going to also forecast GDP. Uh, uh, would that be an issue? So uh, I believe that was the reason why uh, in 2014 we decided to study further how to release LEI. So uh, I believe Yusek Dennis would have, and his team will actually look into that. So that, that was one uh, a question that was posed to me. <laughs> You're going to estimate GDP and you are also going to forecast during your LEI. And that is why in my paper, I, I didn't do any forecasting. I just showed uh, more turning points. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to read a question that was uh, sent to me privately. Um, we have a question that asks, is it possible in the LEI framework to utilize band pass filtering method in extracting the trend to replace the problems from the HP filter? So I, I, I admit I'm not quite familiar with the technical words there, but uh, Dr. Bersalas and uh, Yusek Mapa, if you wish to uh, uh, chime in, uh, please feel free. Oh, yeah, uh, my answer is yes. There are actually many uh, other ways of uh, detrending now. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's good to look into uh, the new uh, uh, methodologies that have uh, been researched on. Thank you. Yes, oh, and I, for, I forgot to mention that question was from one of our members at the BSP Research Academy, Dr. Laura Fermo. So uh, Laura, salamat uh, for, for your question. So, um, let us check again if we have other uh, comments right now. 
So at the moment, uh, Jed, yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, Jed, if I may add, yes, yes, please. Actually, please. Uh, this uh, uh, LEI using the simple methodology. So I'm talking about the simple methodology versus the dynamic factor models that Yusek uh, uh, Dennis actually did in his research. Uh, they, they, there are so many possibilities. <laughs> There is no a theoretical model that says that this is better than that. It's more about analyzing how smooth the series uh, are, that, that result are. And so uh, in my mind, there is really no uh, uh, hard and fast rule as to which methodology to use, but it's really more about trying out these different methods and comparing how they perform. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that addition, uh, Dr. Bersales. So uh, I'm checking our comments and uh, right now, uh, I guess our audience is still warming up. So I'm sure we, we can uh, come back uh, to this um, topic uh, later on. And at this juncture, uh, I would now uh, like to introduce um, our second lecture again, Dr. Bersales, Yusek Mapa, Thank you so very much. And later on, if you're still on board and we would love to keep you here, I'm sure our audience may have more questions later on. So thank you again, thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, our second lecturer shall be Dr. Peter Julian A. Caiton, BSP UP Centennial Professor of Statistics, who will present the paper entitled, A Hybrid Time Series Ensemble, Deep Learning Forecasting Approach with Applications to Economic Variables. The discussion to follow will be led by Dr. Eric Paolo S. Capistrano, who is the BSP Centennial Professor of Business Administration. And let me just uh, introduce them a bit uh, further. Dr. Peter Julian Caiton is an Associate Professor at the University of the Philippines de Le Mans School of Statistics. He received his PhD statistics degree from the Australian National University with his thesis entitled Essays on Non-Gaussian Time Series Analysis. In the years 2018 to 2021, he was awarded the Banco Central ng Pilipinas BSPUP Centennial Professor Chair for Statistics. Dr. Kaiton is a member of UP COVID-19 Pandemic Response Team and a concession member of the Australian Mensa. His research interests include time series analysis, forecasting analytics, extreme value theory, and quantitative risk management. Dr. Eric Paolo Capistrano is the Banco Central ng Pilipinas Centennial Professor of Business Administration of the University of the Philippines Cesar E. A. Virata School of Business. He is also a principal investigator of the University of the Philippines Korea Research Center. He obtained his PhD in International Management from National Cheng Kung University, Taiwan, ROC. His academic and professional experience covers topics in operations management, management of innovation, management of information technology, research methods, and the Korean wave, with international and national research publications such as In Computers and Human Behavior, International Journal of Human-Computer Interactions, International Journal of Market Research, Asian Journal of Social Science, Electronic Government, and International Journal, Philippine Management Review, and others and with guest speaker engagements in both the private and public sectors. So without further ado, we turn the floor to Dr. Kaiton. Good afternoon po, uh, Dr. Kaiton, and thank you, uh, sir, for being with us again today. Salamat po, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, I think you may be on mute. Um, there you okay. are. Okay, yes, yes, thank you. Um, I'm just going to set up my share screen for a moment, thank you. Um, hopefully everyone's get, getting to see it. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Jed, uh, for the introduction and good afternoon to everyone. First, uh, I would like to thank the Banco Central of Filipinas for continuing support for research in the School of Statistics through the PSPUP Professorial Chairs. I'm thankful, I'm thankful for the organizers, specifically the Banco Central and the UP School of Statistics for letting us have this opportunity to present our research. Uh, in this medium through the professorial chair. And I would also like to thank the discussant who will be uh, presenting his discussion of my presentation later, Dr. Uh, Capistrano. Uh, I will apologize to him for, uh, I may have been a little late of uh, 
forwarding the work uh, because as uh, deep learning networks can be a little uh, can be a little unruly at times. And today I'm here to talk about a hybrid time series ensemble, deep learning forecasting approach, and I apply it to economic variables. Now this is a hybrid because once you already understand the hybridization framework you can really create a lot of different combinations of models possible. In fact, with the idea of ensemble forecasting, from that point on, uh, you can devise a lot of combinations of models that you think would be able to fully extract the hidden patterns of time series. So let me just talk about the outline of the presentation. So first, I'm just gonna be talking about some forecasting models. Uh, the idea of ensemble forecasting, deep learning methodology in its simple form, uh, specifically, I'll be looking into recurrent neural networks as these are the kinds of neural networks that we use for sequences of data. And these have been applied generally to time series data in the field of machine learning. And then uh, this methodology or framework that we call hybrid forecasting. So I'll be presenting a proposed approach. Um, it is something that is still uh, being uh, being crafted because in terms of these hybrid approach, you really have to look or tinker a lot in terms of the parts. And this is some of the preliminary results of that tinkering uh, applied to economic data. And we're going to, I'm going to present how I'm going to uh, evaluate the performance of these models, uh, benchmarking it with other models as well. And then presenting you some of the results and discussions. And uh, this is something that uh, Dr. Erika Bistrano might have not seen because, but then again, it's also a lingering question in uh, the minds of many in terms of the economic situation of 2020 and how do we look forward to 2021. So I have some current forecasts for variables of interest and then summarizing all of these results and some references. So the background, but when you think about forecasting, the basic idea really there is assuming a model that we think appropriately approximates the past behavior of time series, if the past still holds true, could we use that to predict the future of our time series, the future of these economic variables? Now, by making forecasts of time series of interest, uh, a lot of decisions can be made, uh, policies can be devised, we can prepare for what would be the impending impact and anticipate its effects. So some, uh, so a selection of forecasting models specifically selected because these would be coming into use as we go into this discussion. So we have the basic uh, naive or random walk model, which generally what you think of the future is what you see now. Yt is equal to yt minus one plus epsilon t, where epsilon t is white noise. So anything, so the idea just here is with all of the noise happening, what we think will happen tomorrow is what we see happening today. So that's the naive approach or the random walk approach. Random walk with drift is just going to be like, what we think of what will happen in the future is what we see now, plus some constant extra. This extra constant delta, this is what we call the drift parameter, because that is where we're leaning towards. There's always that addition of delta through time. Now, we also have the seasonal naive model, which is common for a uh, common benchmark model for seasonal data, meaning what we will see for what we will see for the next uh, for the next year's same quarter or same month will just be the same as what we see this month, this year, or this month, this quarter. So that's how we would look at that, the seasonal naive. And the regression with linear uh, trend and seasonal dummies. So this is just going to be having a constant term, beta zero, beta one being the linear trend, and then that summation lump, that's going to be just the set of seasonal dummies, each having their own seasonal effect. So generally what we're assuming here is there's going to be a straight line trend and each season has a already constant impact in time series. Now there's also some smoothing approaches in the, in the discussion of seasonal modeling, where we have seasonal and trend decomposition using the lowest smoother, which was devised by Cleveland. So generally, they, they, they assume a structure where the original time series can be broken up into three parts, the trend T, the season S, and the remainder R. 
you solve for the trend and season using lowest smoothing approaches. And number six, uh, the box Jenkins methodology, the autoregressive integrating moving average models or ARIMA for short. Now, uh, they generally assume that current values depend on past values and past forecast errors. That's the best way that I could summarize this one. And if you're a student of time series analysis or forecasting, you might dread seeing these, what we call backshift polynomials because they could be uh, a little bit more complicated in how they kind of get to explain current data for forecasting. Now, we do have exponential smoothing, but there has been a novel way of looking at exponential smoothing. And this is the ETS exponential smoothing approach by Heinemann et al. 2008, of which in the ETS, um, we model exponential smoothing structures with what we call innovations state space. Generally, what this means is now there's going to be a system of equations that have innovations, which is another term for errors, residuals being folded in to the exponential smoothing algorithm. And here you would see uh, in this example. So this is what we call the forecast equation, which generates yt from the individual components. And L, B, and S would be the smoothing equations that explain level, uh, slope, or trend, and seasonal uh, components or behaviors. And then we also have, this one is devised in uh, the book of Heidman and Athanasopoulos. They describe what we call neural network autoregression models. So this is uh, constructing neural networks with uh, autoregression features in time series, which is generally your inputs for the neural network would be past values of the variable of interest, your time series. and Small p is how many lags are you going to use? And big P is how many seasonal lags you're going to use. K is going to be describing how many nodes are you going to use in the hidden layer of the neural network. By default, the K is equal to small p plus big P plus one over two. If you do not have any seasonality in the data, P is just set to be equal to one. So generally this is going to be like the fraction P over two plus one if there's no seasonality in the data. Now, if you set K to be equal to zero, that's going to be similar to an ARIMA model, but there's no, uh, the stationarity constraints are not uh, going to be recognized by the structure of the NNAR. And that is one of the selections of forecasting models. There's still a lot because in terms of forecasting analytics, there's a, uh, an alphabet soup of different kinds of approaches and methodologies in forecasting time series data and forecasting data through time. And in fact, one way, and because of these lots of methodologies each having their own uh, pros and cons, there has been this idea or methodology within forecasting in which you gather all of the forecasts from the different models. And in some cases, this ensemble forecasting from different models performs a little bit better than the individual components. And that is what we call ensemble forecasting. So ensemble forecasting is also known as forecast combination. The idea here is you'll combine, if you have, for example, K models, each generating a forecast, then one way is you can combine them through a weighting scheme where the weights should sum up to one. So each one contributing partially to create the combination forecast. And currently the existing methodology available in option in software is by the research of Ohara and Wild, uh, Ohara Wild, and that would be either you have equal weights or if you're going to use the inverse variance of the residuals of the individual models, meaning the one that has the smallest variance gets the larger weight. So that is how you could do ensemble forecasting. Generally, what we have seen with ensemble forecast, they can perform better 
than the individual component. So this averaging or model averaging is also another name for ensemble forecasting. So more recently, with the increase in computing power being available to the general public, either through cloud computing or a relatively cheaper computing machines compared to long time before. So there has been a growth on what we call machine learning, specifically a subfield of machine learning we call deep learning. Now, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning that deals with layered processing. So there would be different layers of structures uh, of mathematical structures to process and analyze data to approximate the variations or behaviors of output data. And these layers are connected through what we call neural networks. The idea of them being called neural networks is because of the analogy of how uh, our biological structure, our biological neural system would send synapses to respond to different stimuli. Think of stimuli as input, the response of your nervous system being the output, so to speak. And this interconnectivity of our neurons is what this artificial neural network in deep learning is emulating the best it could. Um, an example of a deep neural network that I have here is coming uh, is based on the work of GATA 2019, where generally you would have X's that are the inputs and the layer, there's only one hidden layer here, but in general, you can have more than one. Uh, you can have two, three, or in more complex networks, uh, 20 or 25 or 100 or more, depending on the capability of your computer, of course, because that will be a lot of uh, processing involved. But in this example, there would be different interactions or transformations of the input data. And we hope that these transformations of the input data would come out to uh, emulate the output data and there is a specific way of estimating deep learning, uh, 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 deep learning neural networks. Um, in the simplest way that I would just describe it, it's really just an optimization scheme. Uh, though there are more efficient ways of optimizing possible uh, uh, functions so that you can have better performing deep learning uh, networks. More specifically in deep learning, uh, uh, methods used for time series data or sequences in general is what we call recurrent neural networks. These RNNs process sequences by iterating through the different elements of the sequence, in this case, the different periods of the time series, and maintaining a state containing information relative to what it has seen so far. And this is based on the description by Chalet and Allaire. And generally what this means is based on what they learned in the previous time point, they can carry some of it over for next processing. So this carry over simulates this autocorrelation structure common in time series data in the simplest way that I could uh, look into it. So if you have an input previously and it shows the output, some of that processing has already been transferred for the next input to be processed so there's a carryover, so to speak. Now, carryover is much more weighted when we talk about uh, long-short-term mem long memory uh, types of networks. Because there's a problem with RNNs. Though inherently in RNNs, uh, long-term time dependencies may be carried over theoretically. Practically, they are very hard to learn because in the basic simple RNN, it's carrying over a lot more information. So there would be some level of filtering involved in this carryover. And that is why you have this uh, component of weighting or uh, transforming or just fractioning the carryover through the what we call LSTM methodology. Now, how would RNNs be used in forecasting analytics? Now, Hewa Malagi et al. in 2021 
concludes that a stack LST and architecture with people connections works with these seasonalized data. So before you place an LSTM for use, you would tend to de-seasonalize first so that it could be competitive. Now, SMIL, SMIL and Kuber, uh, and Kuber and SMIL. Now you see SMIL a lot of times here because he's really one of the pioneers of uh, this hybridization approach. SMIL is in fact a data engineer uh, or an ML engineer, an engineer in Uber technologies. So he has a lot of work and much of this uh, work that he does for forecasting analytics is really used for Uber. Um, now, other researchers like Wen, uh, Wen Torcola, Narewa Swami, and Medeka uh, designed a multi-horizon quantile forecasting approach. This quantile forecasting approach lets you have the opportunity to generate prediction intervals because what are prediction intervals? Generally, they're just going to be quantiles of a distribution, or quantiles of uh, forecast distributions. So now let me talk about this idea of hybrid forecasting methodology. It's really here a layered forecasting where you use traditional time series analysis and neural network methods. Again, as I've said earlier, it was pioneered and popularized by SMIL in 2020 with his hybrid exponential smoothing recurrent neural networks model that was the top performing model in the recent M4 competition by Makridakis et al. in 2020. M4 is a, is a competition of forecasters and forecasting models where, where you set the performance, or where you judge or assess the performance of your model in hundreds of thousands in time series. And in the end, uh, the one that tops for much of the competing models is the winner with a cash prize uh, uh, through this competition. It's called M4 because it was started by uh, Spiros, Macri uh, Spiros Macridakis uh, earlier in the middle of uh, post-war 20th century of which there were discussions of which would be the best forecasting model and they had started this competition. So generally, when we think of hybrid forecasting, it's just combining the best of traditional time series and advancements in machine learning to improve forecasting ability. Now, I will admit early on here, while we are, I will be spoiling this a little bit. Um, this is preliminary results. A lot of considerations in terms of manipulating structures of the LSTM and including the um, what models, including the ensemble are in point. So long story short, you will see some failures here in terms of how I have devised it. And it's for me a learning experience through this research to still devise more. So an example that Smil would do is first, um, he would have, we have a specification and this, this is in fact, what we call an ETSMA, uh, an ETSMNM. So this is an ETS, this fraction, this part that is being done by SMIL. It has a multiplicative error and a multiplicative seasonality with no trend for his exponential smoothing. So this is his first layer. Why is there no trend? Because his logic here is he will let the recurrent neural network through an LSM, LS, uh, through a specialized form of the LSTM, he will let the RNN structure, the recurrent neural network, to estimate the non-linearities of possible trend that would exist. So you structure of the level, which is L, and the seasonality, which is S, would be uh, handled by the first layer, ETS, M, and M. Multiplicative error, no trend, multiplicative seasonality. And then he'll combine them together, of which this EXPF, this comes from the neural network, and LNS that came from the earlier one. As you can see here, he integrated exponential smoothing into his neural network architecture. Now, my methodology, the device or proposed methodology here, will be slightly different because what will happen is there will be a filtering through the ensemble forecast 
And this is what is happening here. So the first thing is there will be a filtering through the uh, linear time series and there will be the LSTM stack and then some final processing. Now, let me just describe the individual parts here. So the first would be a filtering through the ensemble linear time series models. And these are the kinds of models that we have here. Now, we will use the heinemann kandekar algorithm for automatic ARIMA modeling. So we will use first the heinemann kandekar automatic ARIMA modeling also the automatic ETS exponential smoothing approach as devised by Hindman and others. The naive approach, which is just going to be your uh, ARIMA 010 with no constant. So the, and then you have the drift model, which we just add the constant there. And note that ARIMA and ETS can be seasonal Pero to, if we ever have seasonal time series like quarterly or monthly data, we'll add three more models into the um, ensemble. And that would be a time series regression with linear trend and seasonal dummies. STL, which is your seasonal and trend decomposition to low S, and the seasonal naive model with no constant. And from this first layer, we'll extract the fit and forecast and the residuals. And from there, we will next process with a normalization. And we normalize using the mean standard deviation normalization. So no, uh, as we know as normalization. And then we process this to an LSTM RNN stack with these settings. So uh, if we are dealing with seasonal quarterly or monthly data, uh, the max length is equal to 12. So in quarterly data, this is equivalent to three, quart uh, three years of length. Uh, for monthly data, this is one year. You may max length for input. What is this max length for? How many inputs would be used? How many input data variables will be used for, uh, for forecasting the current, uh, the current forecast horizon that you're looking forward? So you're using 12, we're using 12 periods for both quarterly and monthly data. If we're using daily data, we'll just look back to 250 days. And this is commonly used looking back to 250 days uh, as input, as input for specific output variables, because 250 days is typically uh, the number of days for uh, stock trading or work days that are in a year, 250 work days. Now, the batch size, uh, this is for the structure of the LSTM in terms of how many data points are being fed one at a time. That would be equal to four for quarterly data. It will be 50 for daily data. Number of epochs is 300. So how many times are we going to be repeatedly submitting the full data set into the network? And the number of periods for output vector is the forecast horizon each here. Now, there would be four LSTM layers. Each layer has the default activation function, which is the hyperbolic tangent. The ADAM methodology would be for optimization. The loss function is the uh, mean square error. And the metric is going to be the mean absolute error. So, and then final filtering to undo denormalization to generate the fixed and forecast from the LSTM. And then we'll just add the RNN and the, we'll just add the forecast from the recurrent neural network and the forecast from the ensemble so that you have your final forecast. Now, generally, if you have your final residuals that has been filtered by the LSTM, and you can do a lot of error metrics or diagnostics from there. Uh, we'll just be showing error metrics in this situation for this methodology. So in terms of forecasting performance, um, we will look at the Philippine GDP from 1981 to 2019. We'll look at the quarterly unemployment rate. Sorry. 
Okay, quarterly unemployment rate from 2006 to 2019. We're not going to use 2005 because of the change in the definition of unemployment during that time. And we'll use the monthly consumer price index on all items from January 1994 to December 2019, base year 2012. So we did have to rebase data prior to 2012. And our rebasing approach here is just so long as we can have in the previous January 1994 to 2012, a situation in which 2012 would average out into 12 months to 100, that is how we would rebase 1994 to 2012. There's still a lot of problems in this uh, methodology since we do not have that kind of stretch farther into 2012 to uh, 1994 to 2012, but that's how we had done that one. The first three here, they are available through the PSA website. Um, and the later two here, which is the US dollar daily exchange rate from January 2005 to December 2019, and the PSEI daily series from 2005 to 2019. Number four, we got that from the Banco Central and Filipinas. Number five, we downloaded it through Yahoo Finance, which has a publicly available information about this daily series. Now, notice that almost all of, that for all of these time series, we cut off 2020 MUNA because everything changed once 2020 came in. So we'll look at the performance pre-pandemic and I'll show you the curious case of 2020 later on. In terms of the test data series, uh, for GDP, unemployment, and CPI, the forecast horizons are 12. They are the test data split. And for the Philippine peso US dollar exchange rate and PSEI, the trading days are all 250. Uh, the most recent 250 days will be the test data set for forecasting. Now, the benchmark models, Chempre models to compare the proposed methodology. We have the Heinemann Kandekar automatic ARIMA algorithm, the automatic ETS exponential smoothing, the NNAR with automatic order selection. P is equal to 10 though, for that is a daily data, because if I submit this to automatic order selection, uh, IO matigil ng computation ni NNAR, so I have to force it to be P equals 10, meaning that it's looking back two weeks into the past. Then you have the top, now this top half ensemble forecast, yun yung top half ng proposed. Because now what I'm looking here is saan, ano bang segment yung important, ano bang segment ng proposed methodology is working? Yung ensemble or LSTM? That's why you also have the bottom half LSTM there. Para lang makita ko ano yung nangyayari behind the scenes with regards to the ensemble, uh, the uh, hybrid approach. Now, forecast error measures evaluated for training and test data set. MAE, mean absolute error, root mean square error, and mean absolute percentage error. Package up some programming options, so set C100. If you're curious what R packages I'm using, I use FPP3, FPP2, Keras, R sample, table, recipes per and metrics. FPP2 is something that I use in teaching. FPP3 is something that I'm exploring to use for teaching later on in uh, time series forecasting, uh, time series and forecasting. So let's show some results here. Um, first is the GDP, and this is cutting off the 2020 MUNA because everything changes from 2020, as we have said earlier. And in terms of what happened into the results, I'm highlighting here the best performing model. In this situation, Arima was performing pretty well. The poorest performer here was the LSTM. And again, we showed early, we discussed earlier that one of the research of uh, one of the points of LSTM, medyo mahina siya kung uh, hindi pa filter out yung seasonality. So that's why we have here the poor situation on the bottom and LSTM. What was surprising for me was the ensemble that I had was still performing pretty good at 25,000 MAE uh, in the training data set. And in the MAPE, 1.45% average, uh, uh, average absolute percent error, which is pretty good, but the best one is ARIMA. The proposed methodology, and this is something that we noticed earlier, 
it's always uh, it's almost always going to be in the middle of ensemble and LSTM. And that's something that I will be uh, noticing, except for some instance in the current forecasting situation. The unemployment rate. So this is, it was generally declining up to 2019. However, in 2020, you will notice from the work of uh, Mam Lisa Bersales that it shot up suddenly in 2020. And that is something that had happened. Now, in terms of the unemployment rate, the best on the uh, situations here, it's relatively mixed. On the training data set, it was seen that the neural network AR was doing better, as doing better. But in the test data set, uh, it's mostly the ensemble doing good. ETS sometimes, yeah, ETS sometimes uh, performed well compared in the root mean square error. Uh, again, in terms of what we notice with the proposed approach, um, it's always in the middle of uh, ensemble and LSTM performance proposed approach. With the consumer price index, set training data set, okay, see proposed. Uh, so test data set, um, okay, see Arima. And again, what we were seeing, uh, ensemble and LSTM was in the middle of, uh, uh, is the bounds seems to be the bounds for the performance of the proposed methodology. With the peso dollar exchange rate, uh, NNAR seemed to perform well. And this, this is an NNAR with equal stand. Oh, sorry. Did I? Ah, uh, yes, I did not. So, so in here, what we are seeing is NNAR was relatively performing better. Um, Again, the proposed is in the middle of ensemble and LSTM. Arima was the poor performing model in this situation for the test data set. So NNAR was relatively good in terms of forecasting the peso dollar exchange rate. And this is forecasting 250 days of the peso dollar exchange rate. And then in the PSEI, dito naman yung Arima yung uh, nanaig if I would use that term. Um, again, the proposal is in the middle of ensemble and LSTM in this situation. The curious case of 2020 for the current forecast for variable of interest. So in this situation, this is the real data for 2020. And the top end ensemble, we didn't show the bottom end anymore because we already saw, we, we saw again, the same pattern that it's poorly performing. So the top end ensemble, ETS triple A, yung best performing for 2020 for uh, forecasting na nangyari for the for the period of 20 for the period of 1981 to 2019, it seemed that the ETS AAA, which is additive error, additive trend, and additive season, uh, seasonality, there is what we have here, Arima. This is an AR1, uh, I1, and seasonal integration of order one with quarterly data. And this is the proposed. The worst performing was Arima. The best performing was the top end for 2020. Um, and as you can see, well, it just so happened that the top end was performing. It's because it's relatively generating a little bit lower forecast than the other three here. Uh, the ARIMA is still assuming growth uh, in uh, the data, while the top end is a little bit more uh, on the lower end. In the unemployment rate, a uh, major mix, but then again, this is something naman na that we already saw. Uh, RMSE favors to propose, EPS AAA uh, favors, is favored by MAP and MAE. Um, ARIMA 1-1, one, one, uh, the worst performing is the ARIMA. And what was automatically selected was this model, which has a lot of moving average terms, 1MA and 2-seasonal MA with drift because we have I-1. In the consumer price index, Arima was best performing. The proposed was worst performing. And if we look for, ah, we didn't do this for the daily data. Uh, it was being, as I've said earlier, unruly 
how to do this with daily data. So that's why we just uh, did it for the three other uh, quarterly and monthly time series. Now, what if we do this for 2021 onwards? This is what we already observed for GDP in the past three quarters. And as you can see, generally, most of the models here are still carry, they still haven't moved on with the situation of 2020. Um, hopefully with what we are seeing with uh, the trends, hopefully it is really recovering. But as we see now, um, most of the models are, haven't moved on from 2020 decline. Um, this one is Arima in green. Now you have here the um, hybrid is the brownish green here. And the ensemble is the purple. Now, in terms of which one performed better, it was the proposed approach, though it still has a relatively high mapper for comfort in terms of uh, being 10 at least, uh, greater than 10%, but it is the lowest out of the four here. It's generally because it, the proposed methodology was more optimistic than the other three. And in the unemployment rate, uh, as you can see, Mejo may carry over na some seasonality coming from both the hybrid and the ensemble. This one is the ETS. So the ETS just became a non-seasonal random walk-like uh, model. And then the ARIMA model is something na uh, converging to converges to a constant. So here we see that it is thinking that um, there is no stochastic trend. And in fact, in selection yeah, is AR1 with mean with a mean constant. And it was the best performing model. It's because siya yung mas malapit dun sa what we are serving right now. But this is just for three periods. So this is still uh, what we're seeing as of yet. So itong error measures na ito is just because you only have these three periods as of now. And this is the consumer price index. So this is for one month. And ito yung ARIMA. And as you can see, the consumer price index sticks with the ARIMA model. Uh, the ARIMA model sticks more to what you're seeing with the consumer price index. This is the real data and this is ARIMA. And these are the other three, hybrid, ensemble, and ETS. Hindi uh, nakikita in this situation, the other three are more pessimistic because they think that the consumer price index is going higher. If uh, the consumer price index is still going higher, they, it means that they think that prices will still go higher then. So in terms of the performance, uh, ARIMA is better because the ARIMA tends to stick well with what we're seeing with the consumer price index in the past nine months. The proposed methodology was uh, a relative loser. So in summary, so we have showcased a hybrid approach in which an ensemble of traditional time series and stack is stacked above an LSTM structure. And based on this selection of fork of economic variables, the performance of the design method generally lies between the top end ensemble and the bottom end LSTM. And we think that there's still room for development for further uh, modification of what I have right now. And in fact, for me, this opens a lot of open questions and creative model construction to be explored in this new field of hybrid forecasting. And let me just show you the references of the work. And thank you very much and stay safe always. All right, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kaiton. Uh, music to my ears, I'm a data science uh, buff uh, myself. So uh, now um, we welcome Dr. Capistrano for his discussion. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor, and thank you for being with us today. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. So, yeah, admittedly, of course, like going through all of that, uh, okay, all, all of those uh, mechanics, and uh, I cannot help but applaud Dr. Kaiton for pulling in all the effort to do this and trying to set a standard for everyone else, or everyone else, uh, for, uh, for us to follow uh, uh, what he's trying to do. And uh, me as a business person, uh, we uh, this uh, this already communicates to me the challenges uh, that we that our statisticians, our data analysts have um, uh, in 
in coming up with better models and better and better approaches for us for us to uh, uh, to make decisions and to and to craft policy as well so that being said once again uh, uh, thank, thank the, I will thank the Baco Central ng Pilipinas and the School of Statistics for having me and uh, deeming that I can I can provide a meaningful discussion to what uh, Dr. Kaiton uh, has presented so for the next few minutes, I will be uh, focusing more on the challenges and opportunities that are brought about uh, through through what we have are experiencing. So I, uh, when I was given this assignment uh, to to be uh, Dr. Kaiton's uh, discuss, uh, I was actually forced to read some of the rec some of the references that he uh, that he cited, uh, and I would be uh, sharing some of them here. And for that matter, I was, I was also very curious as to what the M4 competition was all about. And uh, yeah, and uh, based on what I have also read, I, and I will share them here in a little while, there are very interesting tidbits to which we, okay, we as academicians, especially from the University of the Philippines, can also look into. So this particular discussion will now focus on two big points. The takeaways, which would include my reactions and insights uh, while reading the okay, uh, reading the references, and uh, that uh, that would support what Dr. Kaiton did, and looking ahead, okay, questions for future discourse. So, takeaway number one is the field is constantly evolving as it should. Okay, so the appreciate uh, first of all. Um, I felt this big appreciation of the fact that data management remains an experiment-intensive art. To quote, okay, to quote the previous researchers. So in this field, and uh, one of the things that I take comfort with, uh, with what we are say that we are uh, experiencing right now, it's uh, it's not all the time that the data can behave in the way that we uh, the way that we want it to be. Uh, as earlier mentioned by Dr. Kaiton, uh, some depending on the depending on some uh, on the frequency of the data, it can be very unruly when subjected to machine learning. So that's and that would uh, that brings back okay, that brings us up back to the appreciation that indeed data management remains an experiment intensive art. So students out there and researchers out there do not lose heart if the first time around or the first few times around. Uh, we are not very success, successful in running our data through through an experimental uh, model or through a model that is, that is still considered to be uh, very new and is subject to to many iterations in the future. Okay. It's also appreciation of the fact that the field must constantly evolve to address the ongoing challenges of developing models for prediction purposes. So increasing activity and hyperactivity entailed in decision making and policy formulation. And of course, coupled with that is the increasing clamor for better, more accurate, and more transparent data and reporting. Part of the data sets that uh, Dr. Kaiton tried to use is the exchange, are the exchange rate data, the peso dollar exchange rate data, and the Philippine Stock Exchange Index data, two things that probably I would be more, <laughs> I'd be more familiar with given my background as well. So, and as we can see, okay, the more developed markets uh, are using high frequency data for, for tracking exchange rates and tracking, uh, tracking stock exchange, so stock exchange uh, uh, activities. And these, the, the, these are minute by minute changes in, in the stock price, for instance, can trigger can can trigger uh, instant decisions right away. Now that I think about it as well, what could what could possibly be the, the contributions of this hybrid approach in prediction for let's say cryptocurrency for Bitcoin? And now that you know, there's a there's a there's a wider and uh, a, a steadily growing acceptance of uh, other forms of trading. And so, what and uh, so what can what can it do, what can it do for uh, uh, for for cryptocurrency as well? The second takeaway is rethinking, of course, the balance between inclusiveness and parsimony. So, understanding that these developments should prompt academics and researchers to rethink on how we maintain the balance between inclusiveness and, pars and parsimony. Uh, and the inclusion of more variables to a model is always something that is tricky. 
And for that matter, uh, the, the, the inclusion of several of more approaches on how to analyze data is also very tricky. But now we can see that it is a possibility and it, it is a reliable, it, it is growing to be a reliable uh, alternative for us researchers to consider, okay, to consider the, the, like maybe it's time that we could, we should think that we should be more exclusive, uh, inclusive in how we deal with analyzing, with handling and analyzing data, especially much more so in the light of advances in technology on okay, the improvements in the absorptive and computing power of statistical hardware and software and introductions of new iterations and versions of statistical modeling. Okay. The only thing that's stopping us now is the power, okay, the power of what computing device that we're going to be using. But uh, Dr. Kaiton has already proven, okay, proven to a, to a very big extent that computing power, okay, uh, the, the, the absorptive computing and predictive power of new trends uh, such as machine learning okay, uh, yeah, is is something that we really need to consider now, and and we need and we need to think that we we can be very exclu uh, inclusive. However, at the same time, the more uh, the, the more inclusive that we get, the tendency is become it the, everything kind of like explodes in terms of you know, in terms of you know how do we untangle this? How do we untangle that? Is this uh, is this something that we need to? consider regarding data management and probably how variables relate to one another. So those are the two big takeaways that I, uh, I've uh, drawn for, uh, from, from this research, and uh, which is now followed by four, okay, four points uh, of, um, for, for moving ahead or looking ahead. So the first, first part is exploring, obviously exploring the further refinement of the proposed model. So as presented and discussed, there are still some issues regarding the overall accuracy of the proposed model's predictive potential. And uh, we, as we have seen, uh, the, the, error, the comparison of the error terms, okay, is, is, uh, there, there's still a lot, lot more work to, uh, to be done as far as the hybrid model, the, high, the proposed hybrid model is concerned. So some of the questions I'm going to throw about, and forgive me if this sounds very naive or, some, or maybe Maybe something's out of the ballpark right away, but you know, as a person who wants to understand this further, and as a person who can see some potential here, but does not fully understand uh, all the intricacies at this point. At yeah, this point, so is there an is there probably is there a need to think about how to standardize quote unquote the data to fit the proposed model? We've seen that there are a lot of filtering. There's a lot of management, even entertaining the fact if we're going to de-seasonalize the data or not or uh, these are these are questions that were that were ra uh, ra I raised when I was reading through the uh, reading through the research and with that probably also it's like is it also possible that some somewhere down the road there will be some new assumptions to be made regarding the data to fit the proposed model so from a especially from a theoretical point of view and wherein we are taught that we, we need a lot of pre-preparation of the data before we subject it into some modeling, okay, some modeling. And we need to make sure that our data fits a certain set of standards or assumptions. So, so, that's some, so those are things that because of the developments now, because of uh, high, the, uh, the event of hybridization of, mod, of models, is this is this even something that we, is it worth considering the standardization and you know maybe they're thinking that maybe some there's maybe some standardizations that we can need to revisit or some assumptions that we need to revisit uh, with the data and of course and just to be very ambitious about it is it possible for us to have a similar M4 competition or M4 environment I've read through I I, I browsed through the website of M4 it's a, it's a very interesting and very and highly advanced, uh, highly advanced uh, event, and probably that's something that we need to consider. Looking on, okay. looking ahead, also for point number two, exploiting obviously machine learning development. So, what are the opportunities presented by the continuous developments in machine learning for predictive purposes? How can we continuously find ways to overcome the current weakness of machine learning in more typical time series forecasting? So we see, okay, we uh, we see here that uh, the data can behave un can behave unruly, uh, can be unruly, 
depending on okay, depending on its nature. So can uh, how how much effort do we need to exert? How much more how much more time do we need to spend for us to find these ways to overcome? And how much support, of course, our researchers need for them to continuously do their work. And one more thing, uh, as, as a professor of innovation and, uh, and uh, information technology, I always caution my students as well that can we properly manage the trajectory of technological advancement vis-a-vis -vis the, the trajectory of its use, in this case, the trajectory of prediction model development. Because there are many times that the, the, the pace of technological advancements far, okay, are, is, is much more okay, compared, to, compared to the uses that uh, we have. And sometimes because of this gap, okay, because of this gap, we, uh, we, we fail to maximize the, the potential of the technology. Point number three are considerations regarding data collection and use. So the, obviously in the industry, okay, in, in, in the market, in the market, uh, with, with decision makers and with, with, with the general publics, you know, because of the events of big data and big data analytics, you know, there, there are intensifying calls to focus efforts on collecting higher frequency data versus using lower frequency data. But of course, but during the last two, three years, there has been some calls of calls as well to probably take a step back and see whether or not. Is the demand for more accurate data always equate to resorting to higher frequency data and hence more data points? So, so that's so those are the because right now we can also observe that we are so okay, we are so keen on collecting more and more data, analyzing more and more data, but we tend to forget is okay, are all of that data points useful? Are all of the data are all the data sets fit, you know, fit the modeling that we should? So those are, uh, and by reading through this research, I also, uh, I also realized that as well, that uh, maybe, maybe we need to also rethink our definitions and our, uh, our perceptions regarding what actually is accurate data. Okay. And looking at the fourth point, what's next with new and improved methods? So are we expecting some fundamental changes with the introduction of these new and improved methods, and I dare say, I dare say, I might be too bold in saying it. Will, it, will this entail some new and improved benchmarks in the future, and with new and improved accuracy measurements as well later on? Will, uh, will there come a point where in we, when we try to uh, when we try to measure the accuracy of a proposed measurement, or proposed model, or proposed measurement tool, or uh, we may need to rethink okay, why those things as well. So it's really like I can envision that this is something that's very breakthrough and would require a lot of rethinking in terms of how we understand and how we appreciate whatever, whatever analysis, whatever approaches, and whatever decisions yeah, that, we derive, that, we, that we come up with and, and uh, with, this, okay, with this new models that we are seeing there. So, and uh, so some reflections. So, so this is a screenshot of the... Uh, so of the end now it's actually the M5 competition. So uh, from what I've seen, uh, initial results have supposed to have come up this year, uh, uh, this year, and then like the next round of the M5 competition would happen in 2022. Okay. So uh, so with this, it's really like an ongoing iterative process, and, and I do applaud my colleagues from from the field of statistics for uh, putting in a lot of effort in doing this and doing this and ena and enabling to. Uh, not only uh, upgrade and improve, but also you know upscale the way that we analyze data uh, for uh, for uh, business decision news or economics this economic decision or a policy okay, for policy recommendations. And the fact that for the M5 competition, the likes of Uber, a corporate, and Walmart are involved and in volunteer uh, volunteered to uh, their data for this competition for the competition in partnership with, of course, with the International Institute of Forecasters and Google to provide all of these, uh, Google and Kaggle to provide all of these technologies, then we are indeed uh, looking, forward, uh, looking forward to uh, more significant developments in the field of this uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, modeling. Yeah. So with that, thank you very much for your attention.
All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Capistrano, for your discussion. Uh, we will soon open the floor to questions or comments from the audience. Uh, Dr. Gaiton, uh, as our uh, audience members think through questions, would you like to uh, give a few uh, responses to the discussion we heard? Okay. I, I thank Dr. Uh, Eric Capistano for his comprehensive review of the presentation. And again, I am very, I know, very scrupulous to apologize many times over for being late in the submission. And let me just look at some of his questions that I've also typed it in here on my on my screen. And I'm I'm let me read some of those questions. Is there a need that how uh, so first was in some of the questions about the proposed methodology. Is there a need on how to think about how to standardize data to fit the proposed model? Now anything about modeling is always an open question. Uh, there are many ways that uh, data are typically standardized in neural networks. Um, with what I experimented right now, I just use the mean minus uh, uh, minus mean over standard deviation approach. But there are many approaches, and these are linked to how you would really like to model your neural network. So yes, uh, there are certain experiments into doing that on how to standardize. Are there new assumptions to be made regarding the data to fit the proposed model? Now. Again, uh, a lot of open questions Dinaman, in terms of model construction, especially with the assumptions. What, what I was really trying my best into doing, that's why this stacked approach is, my assumption here is that any kind of structure that can be linearly defined, like for example, the seasonality and the trend, hopefully is something that is filtered by the first layer. So that's my first uh, idea here. And then the LSTM will deal with the <clears throat> existing non-linearities that were not essentially filtered by the residuals. So and one idea that might, one might think would be that if, if the first layer is already pretty good in terms of linear fitting and there's no evidently non-linearities to be filtered off, then the LSTM might be adding a little bit of noise more. That's why we were seeing a little bit na parang lagi in the middle yung LSTM at uh, ensemble top and with regards to the performance of the Again, this is still something that we are looking into. My general assumption was anything that could be filtered linearly should have been handled by the first uh, top end and then the bottom end handles any non-linearities. So that was, if I wasn't able to explain that, I'm very sorry, but yes, that was some, there were some new assumptions that we think about when we fit models with oh, when we fit uh, data with two proposed models. Yeah, uh, is it possible to have a similar M4 competition? So right now, there's an M5. Um, that I'm not rich because the cash prizes of the M4 are relatively big. But this is something that maybe some uh, some institutions might sponsor. Uh, in terms of this, this is very creative. I really love the M4 competition, the M5. Um, I'm going to think how I could go into this in terms of my, me participating personally as well, because it's very interesting how this works out. Um, so yeah. And how can we continuously find ways to overcome current weakness of machine learning for more typical forecasting? Again, this is an open problem for a lot of uh, neural network uh, researchers. Um, generally, because yang nakita ko with neural network research is they have this model and they subject it to certain case studies, case data sets, which just so happened to work with theirs. Um, the M4 was the best, I, I think was the better platform in terms of these uh, looking out for the performance of any model per se. And that's why Smil won the M4 and we're seeing what happens with the M5. So uh, in this, for me, in terms of really looking at machine learning in more typical forecasting, if we could have uh, a certain approach in which we really do simulations or really throw us uh, to really see a much more wider scope of applicability of these models, you know, one uh, direction that I'm also looking at, uh, we think, I think should be looked into. But then again, this is again, open problems in uh, neural network modeling, especially for forecasting. Um, can we properly manage the trajectory of tech advancement vis-a-vis -vis trajectory of prediction model development? Um, I believe this is a big question for me still to look into, so I'm, I might not be able to answer that question. Uh, 
there are intensifying calls to focus efforts in collecting high frequency versus low frequency. Yeah, this is something that I also encountered, especially when looking at quantitative risk management, uh, these, this impulse to look at intra-daily data for the trends and for the different movements of especially stock prices. Siyempre, uh, a lot of things happen in the short run for, ano eh, for financial time series then as well. Um, there have been researches in terms of for me, ang mas nakikita ko interesting dito is how to thread together or link together high frec and low frec. And there has been a lot of research, especially in terms of uh, what we call mixed data sampling, yung how to link these two uh, data sets. And more recently, yun nga yung tinitignan ko din, especially with risk management, how to use low frequency macroeconomics with high frequency daily data. And in the past, I also used this for intra-daily. Pero kasi dito sa Pilipinas, wala akong access sa intra-daily data. So that's a different thing. <laughs> okay. Um, in more accurate data, equate to reserving high threat. Uh, and hence, more data points. It really depends then in the end with the data question. Eh. Uh, because there are certain data points that you cannot really get for high threat. Like, for example, the general economic activity of the country. You, do, you cannot... You can only approximate, but that's not really the same as the real activity. Are we expecting some fundamental changes with intro of new and improved methods? Um, these are open questions, especially in forecasting analytics, especially when we look at new and improved accuracy measurements. Uh, the M4 is also motivated in terms of these new accuracy measures. Na parang they just don't look at forecast errors, uh, forecast yung parang forecast between observed and predicted. They also look at confidence intervals more recently. Are your confidence intervals narrower and contain them at the same time? So that's a new uh, emerging field. So there would be certain improved accuracy measures. There are, in fact, also problems with existing accuracy measures. Like, for example, if you solve your map, eh, uh, paano kung zero yung realized value? You would have infinite map, eh. pero there have been certain ways to fix that up a little bit. So it's still open research in that aspect. So I hope that, uh, uh, I hope I could answer as much as I could with the questions that Dr. Capistano has expressed. There you go. Well, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have a, a couple of good questions uh, from our chat box. So fortunately, we still have time for uh, these questions. The first is from Brian Rafour, addressed to Dr. Kaiton. Thanks for the presentation, very insightful and inspiring. Was just wondering if you also were able to come across applications of hybrid methods in applications to signal data, even on abstracted level when you were consulting literatures. Thank you, uh, <laughs> sir, would you like to- When you say that? signal data, do you mean uh, communication signals or am I, de am I deviating far from a tangent? Uh, there you are, uh, uh, Mr. Brian Rafour. Would you like to uh, either raise your hand? Ah, EEG data. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, EEG data. So, parang yung sa heart uh, So, these periodic time series. Okay, okay. Um, because right now, uh, there is a different level of treatment with regards to signal data, and it's generally like EECGs or ano. Um, they are mostly in the realm of the frequency domain. Right now, I'm just looking at hybrid methods that are in the time domain. So, um, in terms of spectra, uh, so in terms of spectral analysis, which do fold into some time series modeling. Um, though right now, uh, I haven't explored on that. Uh, it does get a little bit more complex, uh, more sophisticated if we do the wave approaches. So, you either wavelets or either some spectral decomposition or some spectral analysis. How they feel the time series though. They, there are methodologies uh, in that, especially if you know that your data fluctuates in periods. One example is seasonal time series. I haven't explored that. Um, it is possible to explore that in terms of folding them into a hybrid approach, surely. Um, yeah, it's something to explore. Thank you very much for the suggestion. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, next from Sarah Jane Alarcon. Hi, question for Dr. Kaiton, please. How can we take advantage of combining multiple layers or hybrid of models as presented as compared to maintaining multiple models and leveraging on the strengths of each of them? Don't we compromise the simplicity and tractability of models when we combine them in layers? So, uh, Dr. Kaiton. So, 
Um, in this, siguro, sige. Now, combination of, uh, forecast combination is something naman that is often done because different contribution, different specialists and different experts have some contribution to understanding the phenomenon. And you might have different institutions having different forecast values for the same thing because they have different kinds of inputs, different kinds of references. Um, this is something that we already observe, for example, in other countries. Specifically, I'll just narrow it down to the US CDC, Center for Disease Control, uh, Centers for Disease Control, of which they would often uh, combine together through forecast combination schemes, different trajectories of where they think COVID-19 is headed in terms of the number of new cases and new deaths. So um, these multiple models, they would have different structures and different contributions to information, but oftentimes, uh, as we have seen with the researchers of forecast combinations, it can be possible that uh, these combinations of forecasts perform better than individual performances. Um, in terms of loss of complexity, for me, it's just going to be a scene in terms of a lot of uh, uh, research in forecast combination. It's one way that we could provide better forecasts. We might see different models contributing different information or different structures, because not all one model can explain, uh, explain the behavior. So forecast combination is able to combine together different sources of information. Now, it's still going to be limited of what it combines. So, Still, there's some weaknesses and strengths, pero it's able to at least uh, handle or minimize those uh, cons. And so it will be um, at certain cost in a man of some flows as well. All right. So uh, I'm just reading these in order uh, that I've received them. Uh, another one is from Dr. Fermo of the BSP Research Academy. Uh, given that the main objective of research is to explore the novel approach of using hybrid time series models in forecasting macroeconomic variables, uh, we, we also need to consider that when forecasting policy variables such as CPI, inflation rate, uh, even GDP levels, these could be subject to the Lucas critique that yes. is, they are not invariant yes. to policy or regime changes the implication yes, yes. being that using a purely time series database approach without prior expectations um you know forecasting purely on past uh, behavior may be too naive because they can be influenced by policy changes and even other external developments especially during unconventional conditions uh doctor uh your your thoughts yes 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 so that is still an open uh situation uh, an open problem inside hybridization that's also one of the issues still that SMIL has to look into, the inclusion of uh, other information. And in fact, even if you already have included this other information, you do encounter the problem of Lucas critique, which is, uh, yun nga, uh, because these policy variables can be affected by, other, uh, by the interventions that are available or some unconventional environment, like for example, the COVID-19 pandemic, so yes, we do understand the situation. And in fact, that is something that is being looked into in the general idea of forecasting methods. We do have in terms of forecasting analytics, the methodology of qualitatively uh, adjusting forecasts through a pool of human experts, not just machine experts here, where um, one example of these qualitative forecasts is the Delphi method of uh, collating uh, forecast opinions from different experts. And this is not some, this is generally a critique of any statistical model that would perform prediction or forecasting these uh, in economic time series, these interventions that, or policy variables that, or policy interventions in general that could affect. And Yes, that's the limitation of a lot of forecasting methodologies. And in forecasting, there exists a methodology that we call qualitative forecasting adjustment, one of which is Delphi. So 
we will have limitations naturally. That's that's the nature of forecast modeling naman talaga. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and the next from Michael Van Sopranes. Hi, Sir Peter. Based on your experience, did you see any possible relationship between convergence of algorithms or prediction accuracy with frequency or length of time series? As I understand, there is a lot of empirical evidence showing that the benefit of deep learning is earned when working with tons of data points for the case of non-time series problems. So uh, your thoughts? Well. So this is an open question as well in, I'm not a open question. That's why it's so exciting to research and forecast analytics. So this is another open question in terms of um, how models would perform in long or short time series. SMIL is a motivator in the field of forecasting analytics in short time series, as I said earlier. And, um, and a lot of examples typical of deep learning methodologies, especially with forecasting, uh, look into a lot of time series. And in fact, one example that I showed was like the sunspot data. It's a common, uh, it's a common toy data set for a lot of deep learning methodologies. And they would use um, centuries of data for them to model. Now, I would be glad if we have centuries of GDP data available for us. Or, well, the problem with the Philippine data having uh, century, uh, Philippine data, for example, in stock exchange, uh, around 1992, 1993, uh, we just started the floating market, uh, inter uh, floating market, uh, floating market rates for exchange, uh, floating market exchange rate. Sorry. So before that, we were a little bit more into fixed rate, which you don't really forecast anyway. So it's an open problem. Um, some modifications would have to be done with neural networks if you want to do them in relatively short time series. Uh, a lot of examples in neural networks and forecasting tend to like using long time series, centuries in some cases, as a toy data set of sunspots would be typically done. Um, that's why we are looking, we are experimenting. What if we look at in typical forecasting situation with economic variables in this situation? So yeah. Thank you. For right, that. right. Thank you. Actually, a follow up from uh, Michael Van Sopranes as well. Uh, is it possible to add a regularization layer and and okay, yeah, that one. Yeah. So I mean, we have drop out and you know cross. Ah, uh, yeah. Stuff. Right now, I didn't add any drop out. I didn't add any drop out. You, you can. I yeah. can try on that. Yes. Hindi yeah. ko palang nilagyan ng drop out kasi nga it's 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 for me wanting to experiment a little bit. I do know that Smil has some additional options. In fact, he's using a different kind of LSTM. Mm -hmm. uh, a convolutional LSTM of which Sakeras in R wala pa siya. Uh, uh, yeah. I have to move to Python. And the, in fact, Smil is using C++. So uh, it's a much more complicated scheme for doing that. Um, so in the NNAR though, in the neural network autoregression, parang uh, I would have to look first at the options of NNAR because NNAR is based on uh, a default neural network function existing in, in R. Parang may default fitting function si R for NNA na adaptation ng NNAR. So I'll still have to look if they have the dropout or regularization scheme. I did not first do any regularization for LSTM for the meantime. Um, but it's an open thing that we can look into. Um, so yeah, thank you. All right, and uh, we have two minutes in our Q&A according to our schedule. I want to bring it back to Dr. Uh, uh, Capistrano. Actually, coming from me personally, you, sir, as a, as a professor of innovation, for example, what's your fearless forecast on how far from today will all, this, all these methods, machine learning, be mainstreamed in, in Philippine um, sectors, not just in academe, but also by our, uh, you know, our economic giants or our main corporations. I'm sure there's a lot of investments in, in machine learning here and there, but what's your, what's your uh, take on the timeline we're going to be seeing? I know the, uh, the, the national AI strategy for the Philippines was launched by, by uh, uh, led by DTI a few months ago, right? So what's your take well, there? Um, hmm. That's actually a very good question because most of the most of the more active applications of all of these new technologies you're seeing are from smaller from small firms and from the private sector, uh, and and uh, 
uh, as as with any other endeavor, like as any other endeavor, what we're see what we're seeing is that the private sector takes the lead, and hopefully down the road somebody would lobby for a for for us in the public sector in the academe to have uh, a unifying strategy on how is it handled. Uh, so for example, so for example, uh, like my colleagues in the Department of Accounting and Finance have been clamoring for all of these online stock brokers to have more <laughs> yeah, to have more like uh, like better and more improved like uh, modeling so that they can make better recommendations and we've seen like pockets here and there and this has been going on for what probably two three years maybe four and whatnot so as far as my fearless forecast is concerned what 10 years down the road maybe yeah 10, yeah, 10 years down the road maybe like we're gonna see more more of these developments and uh, and hopefully as we as we embrace more of these technologies, especially for commercial uses, like I know the Baco Central just meant just just uh, 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 just like uh, entertaining all of these digital banking channels. So obviously the next step there would be you know, how do we now harness all of the data that we're going to uh, generate from there for a more unifying strategy uh, for us to move forward. So yeah, I would probably say like maybe like yeah, ten that ten years down the road you see more of this coming up. All right, thank you, sir. Well, now, actually, we have to move on to our next and last segment. Uh, before we do that, a, a quick read of a comment we received. Uh, Foresight, University of the Philippines should invest in terms of capacity building for the digital age to prepare the Philippines as the new start, UP, startup innovation hub in Asia for machine learning, artificial intelligence, and such. Um, so thank you for that comment as well. So uh, thank you, Dr. Clayton and Dr. Capistrano, as well as to our participants who shared questions and comments. As a sign of our gratitude for our dear lecturers and discussants, we have prepared certificates of appreciation. We wish to call on Dr. Joseph Ryan G. Lansangan, Dean and Professor, School of Statistics, University of the Philippines, Diliman, for a simple but very much heartfelt award ceremony. <clears throat> Sir, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jed. Uh, good evening, everyone. Before we proceed to the presentation of certificates, uh, for the benefit of everyone, let me briefly explain the awarding of professorial chairs to UP faculty. A professorial chair is a form of recognition for achievement in the academy, established to advance knowledge and learning in various fields or disciplines. And uh, this is awarded to a faculty member who has shown outstanding performance in teaching, scholarship or research productivity and service to the university and the larger community and when awarded the recipient shall deliver their professorial chair lecture or publish their work in the case of statistics uh, two professorial chair awards are supported by special endowments from the banco central ng pilipinas so we have the bsp up centennial professorial chair in statistics and the BSP Sterling Professorial Chair in Government and Official Statistics. So thank you again, thank you very much to uh, BSP for the continuing support. And uh, this afternoon, we are fortunate to listen to the lectures and participate in the discussions of the research studies of our uh, PC holders from the School of Statistics, Dr. Bersales and uh, Dr. Kaiton. So uh, everyone, please join me in recognizing their contributions and uh, showing appreciation for their lectures uh, this afternoon. So, uh, UP School of Statistics and uh, BSP uh, Research, Acad uh, Research Academy award this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Lisa Grace S. Bersales. 2021 BSP Sterling Professorial Chair in Government and Official Statistics for her excellent lecture entitled Revisiting the Leading Indicators of the Philippines Leading Economic Indicators System held on November 26, 2021 uh, via Zoom. Uh, signed, yours truly, and uh, Dr. Maria Almasara Cid Tuanyo Amador, uh, Deputy Gover Governor, Corporate Services Sector, BSP and head of the BSP Research Academy. And then uh, again, uh, thank you and congratulations to uh, Dr. Bersales. And then we have uh, for Dr. Kayton, uh, UP School of Statistics and BSP uh, Research Academy award the certificate of appreciation to uh, Dr. Peter Julian A. Kayton, 2021 BSP UP Centennial Professorial Chair in Statistics 
for his excellent lecture entitled A Hybrid Time Series Ensemble, Deep Learning Forecasting Approach with Applications to Economic Variables, held on 26 November 2021 via Zoom. Uh, signed by uh, yours truly and uh, Dr. Uh, C. Tuanyo Amador, Deputy Governor, Corporate Services Sector, BSP, and Head of the BSP uh, Research Academy. And uh, of course, our uh, again, uh, thank you and congratulations, Dr. Kaitan. And uh, our gratitude also extends to our discussants uh, for this afternoon's uh, lectures, uh, NS Mapa and uh, Dr. Capistano. So the UP uh, School of Statistics and uh, BSP uh, Research Academy award this certificate of appreciation to uh, Dr. Claire Dennis S. Mapa in grateful recognition of his expertise and invaluable service as discussant at the BSP UP Professorial Chair Lecture Series held on 26 November 2021 via Zoom. Again, uh, signed yours truly and uh, Dr. Uh, Seed uh, Amador. And of course, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Eric Capistrano, uh, UP uh, School of Stat and BSP Research Academy award the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Eric Paolo S. Capistrano in grateful recognition of his expertise and invaluable service as discussant at the BSP UP Professorial Chair Lecture Series held on 26 November 2021 via Zoom. Uh, signed, uh, yours truly and uh, Dr. Seed Amador. Again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, uh, Sir Jed. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Lasangan. And again, to our dear lecturers and discussants, maraming maraming salamat po. We, that's about it. We invite everyone to give the lecturers and discussants a round of virtual applause uh, using the Zoom buttons at, in the, at the bottom of your screen. So uh, please do uh, react if you can. Um, and before we close, we wish to announce that there is a feedback form, the link to which shall be flashed on the screen and shall be shared in the chat box, as well as email to the participants after the event. Uh, the feedback form is a prerequisite to any certificate requests for those who may need certificates of attendance, but your feedback is welcome whether or not you will be requesting a certificate. Uh, your thoughts will surely help us in preparing for our future events. So thanks, thank you, thank you everyone, our UP colleagues, our BSP colleagues, uh, everyone, our participants, uh, have a good evening and good weekend. So, salamat po. Thank you.